Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Raven Cast. I'm your host Adam Erickson, and at the Raven Cast, uh, it is a product of the Raven Foundation, which uses mimetic theory to try to uh, help make religion reasonable, violence unthinkable, and peace a possibility. And um, we usually talk about Christianity here at the Raven Cast because I'm a Christian, um, but it is I realized after the attacks in Paris just how important it is for us to have conversations with Muslims um, and people of other religions. And so the most important thing that I thought of was to invite a Muslim to come on and talk with us about Islam. And I am so happy that today we have Shema Salam Summer here to talk about Islam with us. There is nobody really that I would rather talk with right now than Shema about Islam. I've had many experiences with Shema and she is of the best that humanity has to offer. And so Shema, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. I mean, I think you are the best that humanity has to offer, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I love reading your articles. I always um, gain beautiful insights and knowledge and uh i really respect and uh, admire the work that raven foundation is doing well thank you shema thank you so much i um i'm gonna give shema a little introduction and um then we'll get into this conversation about islam um shema earned her master's degree in counselor education from the university of south carolina and she has worked as a professional counselor in many uh, different situations, uh, including at schools, at homes, and in business settings. Uh, she counsels people of all ages. And do you do counseling online? Yes, currently I um, offer free email counseling to different people. Excellent. Uh -huh. So if you would like some counseling from fantastic mm -hmm. Shema, uh, feel free to send her an email. <laughs> um, her website, we're gonna get to it, is how to be a happy muslim.com right yes mm -hmm. so you can mm -hmm. find contact information for her there uh, shema has written two books both on islam uh, the first is entitled the basic values of islam and it provides quranic verses and hadiths or mm -hmm. sayings of the prophet muhammad um, that discusses 70 values of islam including kindness mm -hmm. and gentleness uh, Shema has also written a fantastic, another fantastic book called How to Be a Happy Muslim, Inshallah, Choosing Inner Peace and Joy with Ideas from the Quran, Sunnah, Counseling, and Health Fields. And I, um, as I said earlier, I'm not a Muslim, but I read your book last year, and there is so much wisdom and great stuff about it, uh, in it, about how to be a happy person. Um, which makes perfect sense because Islam is a universal religion. And so the wisdom uh, should make sense to anyone. So it's written particularly for Muslims, but as a mm -hmm. Christian, I found it so powerful too. Thank you. Thank you so much for those positive words. Well, it's, it meant a lot to me. So um, hopefully uh, I, I'm just so happy to be talking with you about it. So Shema blogs at her website, howtobeahappymuslim.com. Uh, you've re you've re recently written a beautiful poem in response to the attacks in Paris uh, called Muslims Stay Strong. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, um, it was just such a profound poem and beautiful poem uh, for me about what Islam truly is uh, in the face of these people who have hijacked uh, Islam and um, yes. are, are attacking Islam uh, from within. Yes. Um, and so I, I kind of want to ask you in light of that, what, what does Islam mean to you? Why is Islam so important to you? Um, Islam means to me um, a way to show gratitude to God. So basically, for me, it's just about how I can pray to God and connect with God and talk to him and show him that 
Um, I love him and I'm thankful to him for what he's given to me, my existence. And so Islam basically teaches us how to do that through praying and fasting and um, doing good deeds. Yeah. So it's about my relationship with God. And, and this is crucial to your book, How to Be a Happy Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about your relationship with God that helps you to be happy, a happier person? Well, um, as I say in my book, uh, the real source of our happiness is God and is our relationship with God. And um, everything else is something to be thankful for. But in the end, uh, really, we, sh I should, we should focus on uh, worshiping God and trying to please him. And so me having that purpose in my life uh, to have this close relationship with God, that fuels my, my happiness and then seeing God's um, responses to me and his nearness to me, that gives me true happiness. What can you, you talk a lot about in the book about um, the five pillars of Islam and the importance that that holds in your relationship with God. Can you talk about the five pillars? Yes. Um, so basically, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that if you just follow the five pillars of Islam, then that's that's enough. That's pleasing to God and you will um, enter heaven. And so the five pillars are basically um, what we should do as Muslims. And if we if we don't do them, then we are we are lacking in, in our uh, sincerity to God. So um, the five pillars, um, the first one is to uh, bear witness that there is only one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And the second pillar is to pray five times a day. And the third pillar is to uh, give charity to poor people. The fourth is to fast in Ramadan. And the fifth is to go to Mecca at least once in your lifetime to perform the pilgrimage there. So those are the basic um, teachings of Islam, but of course, there's so much more to Islam than just those. Um, but because my book basically says that you need to work on your relationship with God in order to really be happy, then that's why the five pillars are important, because they show that you're um, serious about um, work working on your relationship with God. Um, you give a lot to mercy in, in the book and um, also in the poem. And I know that um, in Islam, God is tightly connected with mercy. Like uh, in every chapter of the Quran, well, 113 of 114 chapters start off with the phrase, uh, in the name of God, the most merciful, um, the most compassionate. Can you talk about God and mercy? Um, so as you said, Adam, Every chapter um, in the Quran, except for one, begins with in the, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. So uh, we believe that God chose mercy and compassion as the main um, attributes that he wants us to remember him by. So um, we should always remember his mercy and trust in his mercy. Everything else um, is a somehow it was connected to those attributes of mercy, everything else that we learn about him. And uh, even uh, there's a hadith that says that God has written on his, his throne that my mercy will always uh, overcome my wrath. So he's trying to tell us that trust in his mercy, uh, we do believe that, uh, that pe people, some people will be punished, but um, if we just, trust in his mercy, then hopefully that, that won't happen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does God's mercy look like in the world? I mean, how do you, how do you receive it? How, uh, what does, what is it? So mercy is um, any, any compassion or forgiveness that you see in the world, it's, it's from God. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so there's a hadith in, in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that, uh, you know, God has, the, figuratively, God has a hundred mercies and um, his mercies are in a hundred parts, and then one one out of a hundred of those parts is on earth. And so every type of mercy that you see on earth um, is from that one part of mercy, such as a, a mother horse um, caring for her ch baby horse and not hurting it with her foot or something like that. And then um, the other ninety nine parts of mercy are are saved with God. So it, that just comes to show how merciful God is that like we can't even imagine how merciful he is because any mercy that we can imagine 99 times more is with God and all the mercy on earth is just one part of that mercy so any I mean everything that we see any form of mercy that we see on earth whether it be um, among people or among animals um, that is a sign of God's mercy there's the great verse in the Quran where God says, my mercy encompasses all things. So God's mercy is universal. It's everywhere. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that I love about Islam um, mm -hmm. and that I think that we in the West need, need to understand much better. Um, there's every religion has a particularity to it, but, but also a kind of universalism to it as well. And so Islam in the same way is this particular religion, but also sees um, that, uh, that the prophets of God have been everywhere um, mm. throughout the world, yes. revealing God's mercy um, everywhere. And uh, in your poem, you talk about um, that there is no compulsion in, in religion, that wonderful, that wonderful verse in the Quran. Um, and so can you, can you talk about kind of that, um, that kind of universalism that's found within Islam, where God's mercy is seen everywhere. The name Ar-Rahman, the merciful, um, that is actually translated as mercy for, for all. So, mm -hmm. um, so we do believe that God's mercy is for all people, regardless of religion or whatever. And in terms of freedom of religion, there are verses in the Quran that say that God chose for there to be different religions. And how can you force people um, to believe when God has not willed them to believe in what you believe? So, and I, hopefully um, when this video comes out, I can actually put the, the verses um, in the comments so people can have a reference for them. But, um, you know, like, as you said, there is no compulsion in religion. That's in the Quran. There is no, no forcing. In religion and God is is the most merciful as we said before we can't even imagine how merciful he is and as a Muslim I have to admit that I see um, I see God in every religion I see I see God's mercy and God's help um, not just in Islam so definitely God is um, God is loving he loves everybody one of the ways that we act that out that you have in uh, how to be a happy Muslim is that you suggest that we should either speak well of others or be silent. <laughs> and I just, I love that point. Um, can, you, can you say more about how that helps us in our relationships with um, one another and how it can help us create a happier world? So many people talk about, especially in the counseling field, the power of your words. So uh, what we say, comes true. And so if we can train ourselves to only speak good uh, and think good, then uh, then it brings more good into the world. I mean, obviously. And uh, since my book is uh, more about Islam, there's a strong hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he actually says, if you believe in God in the last day, then speak good or keep silent. I mean, that's, that's an, like a teaching. So uh, I think a lot of Muslims, you know, we don't really reflect on our religion, but that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's so good um, because a lot of what we deal with, as you know, at, at the Raven Foundation is scapegoating. And this feels to me like one of the areas in Islam where it just stops the scapegoating 
like even before it begins. Mm. And and what I thought of instantly when I read that was the tendency to um, gossip about people, to unite. Mm. Uh, like even in uh, you see this in families, in businesses, uh, in mm. international politics. We start uniting by speaking evil against mm -hmm. others and uniting against them. And this hadith is just very much stopping that before it even begins. Mm -hmm. Right. If we practice it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So important for our world. Um, and in addition to that, you have this great chapter on forgiveness and the importance mm -hmm. of forgiveness. And over and mm -hmm. over again, I find myself getting caught even though I know that it's wrong, getting caught in the mm -hmm. trap of speaking not so good about others. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I continue to fall in that trap. And I think that forgiveness is also an important way of um, mm -hmm. enacting God's mercy in the world. So can you, can you talk about forgiveness and Islam? Forgiveness. Um, so forgiveness in Islam is the higher level it's a it's a very high level and uh it's of course it's uh there are many verses in the quran that say forgive and overlook you know forgive others god will forgive you and um i mean many hadiths about like a businessman who forgave the debt of somebody who owed him and, and god forgave him all his sins for that so forgiveness is is really high and um there's also um a verse in the quran that says that um but God does allow justice, you know, if someone does you wrong, you're allowed to get justice from that. But if you choose to forgive, that's like a very special reward that you're going to get from God for letting it go. But Islam is kind of, I mean, we like to say that it's, it's a little bit practical, and that it doesn't say you, you always have to forgive. But if you want to get closer to God, that's the way to go, is to forgive others for what they do to you. Wow. That's, it's, there are so many connections with Christianity in this, obviously. Mm. I mean, Jesus says, forgive, 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 seven times, 70 times, forgive. Um, mm. And this is the same thing that Islam is teaching. If you want to get closer to God, then right. live, live into forgiveness. Um, you, right. you brought up, uh, there's always, there can be this tension between forgiveness and justice. Uh, mm. what does, you mentioned, like, you do have the opportunity to get justice. What mm -hmm. is, what does justice look like in Islam? Well, I mean, maybe this might offend some people, but like, for example, if someone is found guilty of murder, Mm -hmm. then Islam does allow the family of the murdered victim to choose capital punishment. Like mm -hmm. Islam does allow capital punishment when it's clear that murder, the murderer is the true murderer. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Quran and in Islam, it says that if the family chooses to forgive the murderer, then that's a really high level and that like their reward, would, they, will, they will see God and they will see God's pleasure with them so it is actually better to forgive but it isn't um you don't have to forgive all the time that makes a lot of sense to me and i don't find it offensive because what it's doing is mm. pointing towards pointing towards a better way of life a way that's close as you say that way that's closer mm. to god which is yes. through forgiveness through acts yes. of mercy um and so right. that's that I that I love that it just makes it just makes a lot of sense to me. So and you know I mean capital punishment is something that um, we're all still uh, dealing with today. And so mm -hmm. it um, so but this movement towards forgiveness is is so definitely crucial. yeah. One of what what has counseling done to strengthen your faith to uh to uh enhance your faith counseling i i chose the field of counseling because one reason is because my religion teaches us that uh that helping others is a very high deed and and uh so i felt like it was something um that would that would ple be pleasing to god so 
my religion led me to counseling uh, partly, but then your question is how has counseling affected my view of my religion? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Has it, has it affected your view of religion in any way or? I feel that God has, God has guided me to counseling and that through counseling, I'm getting, I feel like I'm getting closer to God and God's plan for me. Mm. So, um, and I mean, obviously when you, when you work in that field, I think you also do counseling. Is that right? Mm. Yes. Um, so, I mean, when you work in that field, you really learn compassion and you learn about the real world and what people are really going through. And so, I mean, just, I guess it's counseling is a way to actually practice, you know, what our religions teach. It can be a very powerful tool for empathy, mm -hmm. which, um, which is one of the things that I think that um, Islam really is getting at with this mercy mm -hmm. and compassion that God is um, entering into the world through the Quran and meeting us where mm -hmm. we are and pointing yes. us towards a towards a better way of life, a more merciful and more forgiving way of life. Um, Definitely. And, and counseling is one of the ways in which God works in the world to help us mm -hmm. meet one another where we're at um, mm -hmm. through empathy. So. I want right. to I want to ask you uh, more about justice. One of the things that I love about Islam as well, and that you find throughout um, Judaism and Christianity, is justice for specifically for the poor and the weak and the marginalized. Um, and can you talk about Islam and justice for uh, what we at the foundation would call the scapegoats of human culture? Yes, Islam. <laughs> Islam um, is very strongly for caring about the poor. Um, in, in one hadith, um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, made a prayer saying, Oh God, let me live as a poor man and die a poor man and raise me up as a poor man. Mm -hmm. And then his wife asked him, why would he say that? And she said, he said, because um, uh, if you love the poor, God will bring you near to him. So he was saying that you love the poor. Actually, you should love the poor and go close to them, go near them. And I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it makes you feel bad, like you're not doing enough for the poor because it's, I mean, my religion just talks all about, I'm sure Christianity does too, about helping the poor and, and caring for them and, uh, there's a, another hadith that says that the person who, um, who spends one day helping a widow or a poor person, it's as if he spent um, weeks fasting and praying all night. So mm -hmm. it's like helping the poor is actually more important than praying and fasting. Mm -hmm. Wow, helping the poor takes on the same level as religious practices. It, it is a right. religious practice. Right. I mean, it's actually like one day of serving the poor or widows actually uh, likened to a whole month of like ritual prayers and fasting. Mm. So it's actually more important to, to help the poor. I mean, there are just so many, there's so many verses in the Quran about um, giving charity to the poor. And it's, it's like even the Prophet Muhammad would say, you know, don't even turn a poor person away. I give them something, give them even half of a date, you know, just give them something. Yeah, there's this great passage in uh, Deuteronomy in the in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, where it says, um, always give to the poor whenever they ask. <laughs> you know, don't mm -hmm. don't hold back, open up your hands, always give. Yeah. <laughs> it's just fascinating to me how how these how the Abrahamic faith uh, just build upon one another mm. when it comes to justice and yes. mercy, um, for the poor. Let's uh, let's talk specifically about your poem. It was just so powerful to me. Um, can w are you able to read your poem for us? Sure. So here is the poem. It's called "Muslims Stay Strong." Muslims stay strong. When evil groups like ISIS represent Islam so wrong, Muslims don't lose heart. When people who claim they are Muslims 
tear our world apart. A true Muslim does not fight others unless they are fighting him. A true Muslim respects all people and knows that you can't force religion. Holy Quran 2.256. True Muslims work for the poor, the widows, and the weak. True Muslims are full of mercy. It is not power they seek. True Muslims bring honor to the name of our beloved prophet. He taught us to do good deeds, to live for God, not for profit. Muslims, stay strong. Our religion is under attack by people who claim they are Muslims, but whose hearts are blacker than black. Muslims, stay strong. Islam teaches peace. The Quran says that if the enemy stops fighting, then our fighting must also cease. Holy Quran 861. Muslims, don't lose heart. Murder is not part of our faith. To kill one innocent person is like killing the entire human race. Holy Quran 532. Islam gave rights to women that they did not have before. It ended the murder of baby girls and marriages done by force. Islam was not spread by the sword. It was spread by kindness and love. It says, do good to all people, Quran 436, and seek the pleasure of God above, Quran 2207. Thank you for reading that and for writing it. Um, it just, it, it does so much to correct misunderstandings of Islam that I see all the time uh, here in the West. And um, you, you put a lot of emphasis in it on peace. There's a very peaceful aura to the poem. And can you talk about Islam and peace? Yes. Um, so peace is really the goal. I mean, the goal should always be peace. And um, there are many verses in the Quran that say that, um, that if, if you're fighting is allowed in self self defense, it's permitted in self defense. Okay, but if the other side shows any gesture of peace, then you must stop fighting. It's that's in the Quran. So um, peace should be the goal and not never violence. I mean, um, when the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, when he re-entered Mecca after being um, forced out of Mecca, persecuted. He entered back, um, he was able to enter back because the Meccans had broken their treaty. And in that time, it was expected that the people who were the victorious, which was Prophet Muhammad and his and the Muslims, that they would um, do whatever they want when they entered um, the city. But he, he told everyone that we don't want any violence. We don't, um, we want peace and I forgive everyone. Um, so if you, if you agree that you want peace, then just don't, don't fight us. Don't come out of your homes to fight. So he actually did something that was very, um, un unexpected and unusual for his time. And so the day that he re-entered Mecca, um, no, you know, no blood was shed. This is, this comes back to, I think your point about forgiveness and the Quran's point mm, about forgiveness, right. because so much of the world especially today, we see it all the time, runs on revenge. Somebody mm -hmm. hits you, you hit mm -hmm. them back, and you just hold on to this cycle of revenge over and over again. And here I see Muhammad coming in very mercifully uh, and offering offering forgiveness. Might, might not have used that, that term, but certainly uh, mercy yes. and forgiveness is the spirit in which he mm -hmm. um, comes, into, comes back into Mecca. Yes. And if, if, and if we lived into that model of forgiveness mm -hmm. um, and the hope for reconciliation, there's this great verse in the Quran that uh, says, um, you may have to remind me exactly what it <laughs> says, but if there is an enemy amongst you, uh, treat them well and they'll end up becoming uh, like right. good friends with you. Right. Yes, you, I always see you, you um, quote that verse in a lot of your articles, and I really appreciate that. But it's actually saying that, um, you know, if someone does something wrong to you, then return their wrong with something better. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that, you will see that you'll come.
close friends. So yeah, that's in the Quran. Um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of verses, like I actually um, put some verses up, but peace is the, the really what Islam wants. I mean, Islam uh, comes from the word peace. Salama means peace. So, um, I mean, there's even a hadith in which the prophet says that, um, do you know what is better than, you know, prayer and fasting? It's keeping peace between people. So he's actually saying keeping peace between people is better than than worship, you know, those those forms of worship. Um, and a lot, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, I don't know why people do this, but they they quote uh, part of a verse from the Quran that sounds violent, but for some reason they don't quote the first and the last part of the verse. Yeah. Um, and I think let me let me just pull up that verse if I can find it. But it's really um, interesting that people don't um, quote the entire verse. The Holy Quran, chapter two, verse one ninety. Um, so it says, fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you. So that's the first part. But then, it's, then it says, do not transgress limits. You know, don't go too far because Allah does not like, does not love transgressors. And then the verse says, slay them wherever you catch them. But then at the end, um, if, if they cease, let there be no hostility except to those who practice oppression. So... Again, in, in two places, it's saying uh, if, if, if it's not in self-defense, then you're not allowed to fight people. I mean, it's, it's permitted, but um, it's, not in, it's not like encouraged to be violent. Uh, there's, there's another hadith in which a man um, told the prophet, you know, what do I do if somebody comes up to me and wants to um, steal from me, steal my household things? And the prophet said, um, ask them to stop in the name of God. And then the man says, and then what should I do if they don't stop? And the prophet said, ask them again, stop in the name of God. And he says that three times, just ask them to stop in the name of God. And then the man said, then what do I do if they still don't stop? And the prophet said, okay, then you can defend yourself. You know, so it's like, really, you want to avoid yeah. violence and fighting. Yeah, yeah. I'm reminded of uh, when the prophet Muhammad came back from a battle and he mm -hmm. said uh, he made the distinction between the lesser jihad and the greater jihad mm -hmm. and the greater, mm -hmm. the lesser jihad is more of a violent jihad. The greater jihad mm -hmm. is what, yes. what is, what is the greater jihad? The greater jihad, jihad means struggle. Mm -hmm. It means any kind of struggle for the sake of God. Uh, the greatest jihad is that of the ego, of the struggle against your ego and the whisperings of Satan. So, um, so it's a, the inner, the inner jihad is the greater jihad where you're trying to be a true servant of God and that struggle within to not commit sin um, and, to, and to not think bad things and do bad things. So that is truly the greater jihad. Now, some Muslims say that, um, that that's a weak hadith that the prophet said that, that he said that the, the greater jihad, you know, we came back from the lesser jihad. But that, I mean, that is true in Islam. I mean, other um, people in the time of the prophet, they said the same thing. And that, because like in Islam, they're like hadiths and say, oh, this is weak and this is strong. But there are many other hadiths that say the same thing. So that is true. That is a true um, statement and belief in Islam that the greater jihad is your inner um, against your own evil inclinations and against the whisperings of Satan. Yeah. Um, and and there are many examples in which the prophet said that, um, you know, your jihad, he, he, he said different things for different people, but he said one to one man, one man, and this is a strong hadith. One man told him, um, I want to go to battle with you. And the Prophet Muhammad said, do you have elderly parents? And the man said, yes. He said, your jihad is to take care of your elderly parents. And um, a jihad can be different things for different people, but it's really about your toiling to get closer to God and that difficulty that you feel. 
it it reminds me of uh one of, of the subtitle of your book on how to be a happy muslim choosing inner peace and quite often uh we end up thinking things like um no they need to be the peaceful ones uh mm -hmm. it's it, they are the problem uh in the world but really what what your book is getting at is helping us to not really point the fingers at someone else but mm -hmm. to choose inner peace for ourselves and i think that mm -hmm. that is so yes. crucial um and so important and also so difficult yes. and it's part of the struggle that i think muhammad is pointing to um is how to yes. choose inner peace for yourself how, how right. do you do how do you do that <laughs> right so it's you know you you really hit on it adam um about uh, not blaming others and uh, taking responsibility for your for your feelings and for your life. So that's that's just crucial. Like you have to just stop blaming others. And if you're um, going through a rough time, you have to just uh, yeah take responsibility for finding a way to achieve inner peace. So it's, it's just, my book is just saying that you need to uh, choose inner peace by looking for solutions, by taking responsibility for your feelings and actions. And like you said, that's really hard. I mean, we, we, we all, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to blame others or outer circumstances, but to just say, no, I'm going to do something to control myself. So it's about self-control too. But yeah, but of course, inner peace, as I said before, uh, the most important factor for that is, is God and trying to be sincere to God. So it's that sincerity in seeking God. That's really what, where it all comes from because in the end, it's God who helps you to have inner peace in the end. But he wants us to, to do a little work too. You know, he wants us to take one step towards him. But we, in Islam, we say, if you take one step towards God, he takes 10 steps towards you. Yeah. So you still have to take the first step, but in the end, it is all God. Mm -hmm. I love that God, one step towards God and God takes 10 steps towards you. It's, it's the mercy yes. of God that's coming towards us at all right. times and receiving that. And what I loved about your book is that typically nobody really teaches us how to do, how to choose inner peace, how to manage mm -hmm. ourselves in these, um, in these very difficult situations mm -hmm. um, uh, of adversity. And your book helped me um, to choose inner peace. And so I'm just mm -hmm. so grateful for it. Um, I, I want to get back to uh, your poem and um, a lot of the narrative in the West is that um, Islam is uh, anti-women, but you point out mm. that Islam gave women all of these rights that they didn't mm. have before and is progressing human rights for, uh, for women in, in particular in, in your poem. Can you say more about um, Islam and, and women? Yes. Um, so Islam, Islamic teachings for that time, they were very revolutionary for women. Um, in that time, women uh, were considered property and they really didn't have many rights. And um, Islam said that uh, women do have rights and you know, Islam ended the common practice of uh, female infanticide, where uh, people commonly buried their baby girls because people didn't want to have girls. And Islam said that was a major sin, really bad, and it, it ended that. And um, Islam clearly gave clear rights to women, like clearly stated, you know, that women have um, the right to choose who they marry. Um, they have the right to inherit money, that they are equal in the sight of God to men, that they are um, as spiritual beings, they are equal in the sight of God. They will, women and men um, will be, both be judged by God um, 
in terms of their deeds uh, spiritually. And uh, Islam gave many rights to women. I'm trying to think. Uh, the, the Prophet's wife, Aisha, peace be upon her, she was a scholar um, of Islam. And, you know, we owe a lot of our hadiths. You know, she narrated many of the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, so Islam really, it really revolutionized women's rights. So that was the spirit of Islam. But uh, I don't know what happened. Like now, uh, today, we don't see that as much, unfortunately. And it's really, um, really a shame. And it's really um, a betrayal of what, um, what the spirit of Islam did for, for its time. But I mean, I, I can say that uh, as a Muslim woman, I am writing articles for uh, the Islamic online university. And uh, there, and we most writers on their blog are women. So it, it comes to show that the voice of women is respected even today. It is still respected and uh, women are encouraged to be scholars, to get educated and to contribute to humanity. I love it. I love it. Um, one of one of the things that I keep thinking about in uh, early Islam is economic justice. Uh, you see it over and over again. And one of the reasons that um, there was all of this uh, female infanticide that they would bury their uh, mm. their girls in the desert was because mm. they were seen as an economic burden. Mm. And and in in the Quran, you you get over and over again to trust that God mm. will supply mm. you, you. Yeah, that's with, so true. You with enough mm -hmm. um, when it comes to economics and in every mm -hmm. area of life that to trust that God will supply us with enough. And so, don't kill your children. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. It's just such a such a such a powerful uh, uh, view of economics because we often get ourselves in this frenzy that there isn't enough. And here is this, mm -hmm. this trust that, that there will be enough and you don't have to be, you don't have to live in fear um, of scarcity. That's, that's a very good point. Um, that's very deep. And yes, trust, trusting in God is, you know, it, it's, what we should do as Muslims, we're supposed to trust in him always. Um, it can be a challenge sometimes, but um, we are supposed to trust in him and to just, just do the right thing. That's what Islam is saying. Do the right thing. Don't be afraid. God will help you. I, I just love it. And that's in our economic life and in our family mm. life and in every area of life. And I think it's one of the ways yes. in, in which we can manage our inner fears and our inner darkness. One of the other things you say in your poem that's so important is you say that Islam was not spread by the sword, but by kindness and love. Can you say more about that? You know, the people will be surprised to know that the most uh, populous Muslim country today is, is Indonesia. Mm. Um, and, and, and there was no war in Indonesia. I mean, there was no fighting there. So how, I mean, what happened? I mean, they, I think they were Hindu before or something. Um, well, it was just kindness and love. I mean, that's the, that's the most populous country. And uh, the, uh, the, there was actually, um, I think there was a missionary uh, named Sir Thomas Arnold Walker. And he actually wrote a book about the spread of Islam. And he even admitted that Islam was spread by um, by merchants, by businessmen, and by the Sufis. The Sufis are like more of the spiritual, esoteric group in Islam. But um, so, he, I mean, he, even he admitted that Islam was not spread by the sword. Um, of course, perhaps there were some uh, some Muslims who did the wrong thing, and maybe they did do bad things in, in that direction, but. The majority of uh, Muslims today, I mean, they were not brought to Islam by, by violence. Um, 
And then another point I was, I did some research on this. Uh, the land of India was ruled at one time um, for a thousand years, it was ruled by Muslim rule. And at that time, Muslims had the, they had the power to convert everyone to Islam, but, um, but they didn't. And I mean, even today in India, people are, most people are not Muslims in India. Um, so, and there are other countries too, such as Spain. So yes, Islam was not spread by the sword and we can go into details about that issue, but Islam is not, uh, Islam teaches that you, you cannot uh, force religion. You cannot um, force people to be your religion. So that's very clear in Islam. Thank you for that. Just to kind of wrap up, if they're uh, in the face of um, ISIS and terrorism uh, that's happening, if there was one thing that you could say to the world about Islam, true Islam, what, what would it be? True Islam is love of God and just trying to please him by doing good, by bringing good to the world, bringing peace and um, helping, you know, like you said, the, the weak and the poor. Uh, that is true Islam. I mean, it's about praying you know, bowing to God. That's, that's the one um, imam said, the Islamic state is just bowing your head to God, the state of, of submitting in prostration. That's, that's the real, the real Islamic state, prayer and good deeds. That is what Islam is about. If you read the Quran, that is what it's all, most of it is talking about is praying and good deeds and believing in God. I love it. Thank you so much, Shema, for this conversation. You've helped me a lot, and I know that you've helped our listeners a lot understand um, true Islam. So, so thank you so much. If, uh, if people want to stay in contact with you, uh, how can they do that? So feel free to email me. Uh, my email is howtobeahappymuslim at outlook.com, and my website is howtobeahappymuslim.com. And... Um, May God bless you, Adam, and the Raven Foundation. And thank you so much for inviting me and for all the work that you're doing for world peace. Oh, thank you, Shema. God bless you too. And thank you for all of your work and for joining us here today. Um, peace be with you, my friend. Peace be with you. Thank you.